Very good to see all of you this morning. We're continuing and actually wrapping up our series of studies on rock-solid faith, and this is part two of the inspired word. We begin again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, where it states, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The question comes up, how can we have confidence that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God? That it stands separate from all other writings of men? How do we know that it's not simply a collection of myths that were brought together and put together by the Hebrews in ancient times. And we just happen to have that in our possession today. It just happens to be a Western tradition to widely accept these things as the Word of God or as the religious text of our time. How do we know that it's different than the Quran that the Muslims use or different than the Book of Mormons? that the Latter-day Saints use? How do we know that it's not just some fanciful ideas and hallucinations or dreams that Hebrews had versus Arabs or versus someone in the early to mid-1800s? How do we know that? Where is the evidence? Is there any evidence that the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is different than those things. But when we do an honest examination, when we do a critical examination of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, we will see the evidence that is there that it does stand apart from other works of men, from other religious texts that people claim to be from God and claim that we ought to follow to be right with God. When we look into the Word of God, when we look into the Bible, we see that it is accurate when it touches on any given subject. So when it touches on history, and it talks about figures in history, rulers or nations, or events that unfold, it's accurate in what it records and what it puts down. In fact, There have been many cases where people have doubted what the Word of God says only to be proven that it is what it says and it is extremely accurate. For instance, the nation of the Hittites. When it touches on geography or when it touches on science, the Word of God is accurate. It is something that is reliable in those areas. When we read it, we understand that we are reading the truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This word that we read here gives us knowledge of how to live our life. It gives wisdom in how we are to behave from day to day, how we are to act in our relationships with one another, how we are to conduct ourselves on the job, in our communities. It gives us that confidence that God loves us And wants us to have a home in heaven with Him. And He lays out the path to have that home. So that we can live in hope. And not live in despair. In Romans 1.16. It says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God. Unto salvation. It has that power to lead us. To that eternal home. And so what we want to do in this lesson. To begin with. Is just simply note the claims of the Bible where it says it is from God. It's not claiming to be from men or hinting around that it is from God, but it makes it a very bold declaration that it is from God. And what that means in the end is that if it is found not to be from God, it's a fraud. If it is found, if there is evidence that gives us confidence that it is from God, that means we have to live by it. We must submit to it. We must accept it. If we have any hope, to be right with our Lord, and to have that hope of eternal salvation. So first of all, let's look at the 
idea that the Old Testament says it is inspired in. Oddly enough, we begin in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, where Peter writes this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these are references, or this is a reference back to the Old Testament, back to the Old Testament prophets. So you would think of Elijah, or Elisha, or Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all those prophets that were there. Peter's pointing back to them and saying they were moved and they spoke at the direction of the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't their ideas, it wasn't their thoughts, it wasn't them discerning what the Creator would want or what the Creator would say about the future. It was the Holy Spirit that was revealing these things to them. If you go back to the book of Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, you go through this entire book about 45 times. Moses says, the Lord said. The Lord said. So Moses isn't saying, well, I'm telling you this. He's saying, God said this. This message is not for me. Moses was just a tool, just a, a conduit. For the word of God. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 then. It says and the Lord said I have surely seen the oppression of my people. And he goes on to speak about those things. If you go to Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20 in verse 1. Remember in Exodus 20 is where you have the Ten Commandments that are given. And maybe you've recognized this. Maybe you've acknowledged this here. Or maybe this is something you've looked over. But it is directly from God. Moses was not given the Ten Commandments and then he went and gave it to the children of Israel originally. Originally, God spoke it from the mountain. As Exodus 20 verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. And he goes on to give those commandments. When you get down to verse 22, it continues on. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. He spoke to them. Of course, they didn't want to hear it. They were overwhelmed by God speaking directly to them and said, no, we want Moses to tell us. But just establishing the idea that God spoke to the children of Israel. These are the words of God, not really the words of Moses, even though we frequently call it, and it is referred to in the Bible, the law of Moses. That law was given to Moses by God. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23, you are of course here in the time of the United Kingdom under the reign of David. And it makes mention of David and about his work, his role in Revelation. In 2 Samuel 23 verse 1, and these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So he says, I was moved by the Spirit of God. That the work of the sweet psalmist of Israel, all the poems that he wrote, were not of his own creation. Now, did David have talents? Did David have knowledge? Yes, he did. But God is the one who directed that. God is the one who guided it. That he might produce all those psalms. So this is the claim of God Almighty revealing the Old Testament, the law of Moses and the psalms and the prophets. If you go to Isaiah chapter 1, 18, and we're just going to run through some very quickly here, where he says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. The Lord was giving that message to Isaiah. Hosea 1.1, the word of the Lord came to Hosea. Joel 1.1, the word of the Lord came to Joel. It's the word of God. Amos 1 verse 3, thus says the Lord. You get to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. This is after Jesus was raised from the dead on that first day of the week. Two disciples are walking along on the road to Emmaus with them, and He begins to talk to them. And then He comes and He's among His disciples on that day. 
In Luke 24, verse 44, the Lord said this, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So the Lord broke the Old Testament down into three parts where He says the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. And what He's saying is all these things were foretold by God about me. And you can go back and you can look at those and see where they were foretold about me. But this is just simply the Lord putting His stamp of approval on the Old Testament from Genesis down to Malachi. This is from God. This is the Word of God. If you believe in Jesus as the Savior, you have to accept that the Old Testament is from God. It's inspired of Him and was revealed by Him to men. When we get into the New Testament then, in John chapter 16, John 16 verse 13, Jesus made this promise to His disciples. In John 16 verse 13, He said, However, when He... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit will come and guide you into all truth. Not to some truth, not to sort of truth, but to all truth. And it's from the Spirit. It's not a group of Galilean men who got together and came up with this conspiracy theory about let's make Jesus of Nazareth a popular figure and put Him up as a Messiah figure and see if people will buy it. That's not what happened. The Holy Spirit guided them into all truth to reveal the things that God would have mankind to know that they may be saved. Remember Acts 2 verse 4, the day of Pentecost? You have the Holy Spirit coming down upon the apostles on that occasion. And it said that they were there and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit was giving them the words that they were to speak, to teach to the people on that occasion. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, the Apostle Paul, which we almost read this morning, in verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. Then he goes into that night when he established the Lord's Supper. He instituted the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, he said, If anyone thinks himself to be a spirit, a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. See, sometimes we run into this issue where people think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded the things that really matter. And those are generally put into the red text. And what really matters is the words that came directly from the mouth of Jesus. But here, the Apostle Paul is making very plain, what I write is the commandment of the Lord. It's not Paul's opinion. It's not Paul being affected by culture and the times he lived in. And that's why he wrote certain things. It's the commandments of the Lord. It's what was given to him by Almighty God. Then let's notice this in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Because this is an interesting note that's put in by Peter almost in a, a passing manner. As he's talking about the final judgment, the destruction of the world, all those things. He says this in 2 Peter 3.15, And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. So Peter says what Paul wrote is equivalent and on the same level as the rest of the Scriptures. And one of the interesting things about this is we know from Galatians chapter 2 that Paul rebuked Peter for falling into sin. And later now Peter is saying, hey, Paul, the one who rebuked me, what he writes is Scripture. It's from Almighty God. Of course, this is all proved to be true in the first century because the signs, the wonders, the miracles that were given to the apostles were given to them 
for the very specific purpose of confirming their word was the word of God and not the word of men. In Hebrews 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? And it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. You know, today, there are things we read about in history that we see these multiple accounts and we accept those things as true. And we put those together and we get a good picture of what unfolded and what happened. Whether that's something that happened in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I or World War II. If you read about D-Day and the invasion on D-Day and all the accounts of the various people who were there, you understand that happened and certain people were in certain places at certain times on that day. You understand that's true, that's accurate. Well, the Word of God records for us the things that unfolded, including the miracles, and you have multiple witnesses giving us this testimony saying this happened. So we understand that it's proven to be true as the Word of God. The evidence of inspiration is found in many areas. You can look at the Word of God, you, you see that it stands out and it is different than other things that men have written. One of the ways that the Word of God stands out is scientific foreknowledge. It's things that are put into the Scripture or woven in there that man at that time could not have discerned or understood with the technology that they had, the information they had. But today we know them to be so. We understand better because of our advancement. But we look at medical, first of all, medical scientific foreknowledge. If we go to Le the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 13, and he's talking there about leprosy. In Leviticus 13, verse 45, it mentions this. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. When it talks about covering the mustache, I believe some translations have covered the upper lip. So he's to cover himself like this, if you will. Well, what that is, is the idea of covering the upper lip is leprosy germs were found in, or are found in the nasal drippings and saliva. And so he was to cover himself so as to not to spread that out. We've kind of gone through something like that this past year, whether you see what, whether you follow the science or not, just leave it at that, that they recognized here in Leviticus that he needed to cover that up. Not to spread it. Well, at the time, they didn't understand germs. They didn't understand the, the microscopic level of things. But God had revealed that to them. He talks about diagnosis of the symptoms, the disinfection, the quarantine, all these things that He has revealed, that He guides them in, that is more like modern understanding and modern knowledge. That's scientific foreknowledge in the Word of God. In Leviticus chapter 17... Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11 down through 14, says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, No one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Whether man of the children, whatever man of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. His blood sustains its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is in its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. You know, a study course of Christian evidence has made note of this, that, you know, red blood cells carry the oxygen. But again, we didn't understand that until relatively recent times. You go back in our nation's history, you look at George Washington, he was bled out. They used to believe in the bleeding to let whatever sickness was out. And he was bled to death. Well, nowadays we understand that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want the blood in there. 
because it carries that oxygen, carries those nutrients, carries those blood cells that will help to repair and heal the body. Well, the Lord had revealed to them long ago, well, the life is in the blood. And we understand that today. Life is in the blood. Then also in Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 17, as the Lord is speaking to Abraham here, and He's telling him he needs to circumcise his sons as a sign of the covenant between Abraham and his descendants and the Lord. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 12, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child of your generations. He who is born in your house or brought with money or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. So they are to circumcise on the eighth day. The reason is because of vitamin K and what it produces, what it helps to produce, if you will. That vitamin K prevents hemorrhaging. And vitamin K is the responsible for the production of prothrombin, if I'm saying that right, it's by the liver. In other words, your blood clots because your liver produces this particular element in your body. And vitamin K production begins between day 5 and day 7 in a male baby. And day 8 is the only time in a male's life, male child's life, that that prothrombin climbs above 100% of normal. And God told them, circumcise him on the 8th day. Why? Well, that's the day where he has more blood clotting agent in him than any other day. And so that makes sense. But we only understand that really from our perspective in modern times. And then in Genesis chapter 3, 3 verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15. All the way back at the beginning. In Genesis 3, verse 15. This is the Lord cursing the serpent. And He says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise His heel. You know, ancient people, ancient wise men thought that only the man had seed. That you could take the seed of a man, you could put it in warm mud, and you could get a baby eventually out of that. That's what they believed. The Bible here reveals now a woman has seed as well. It takes the seed of the man and the seed of the woman to produce a child. Well, we didn't know that till relatively modern times. But here it is revealed when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, something that God spoke while Adam and Eve were still in the garden. That is scientific foreknowledge in the Word of God. More knowledge there is in astronomy and oceanography. As we look at this in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. You will, of course, know that there are people in ancient times, and even in modern times, who believe the earth is flat. That's a pretty widespread understanding as I've, as I've understood it among Muslim nations. That they're being deceived that you know the earth isn't this big ball, that it's just a big flat surface, things like that. But be that as it may, Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. That word circle there is the idea of sphere of the earth. And so it's revealed there in Isaiah. And that's something before man came to really understand about the earth being a big globe or a big ball, if you will. If you go to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job here makes reference to that which is in the deep, that is in the deep oceans. In Job 38 verse 16. <coughs> It says, have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? The idea of the search of the depths is the valleys. You know, men used to think that the surface of the ocean, you just simply went out, you know, just like if you were standing on the beach, whether it's rocky or sandy, that it generally kind of slopes out there. They thought it sloped out so far that it flattened out and it went flat to whatever piece of land was next. And it just was like that uniform. They didn't understand 
that there are great valleys in the oceans. In fact, there is a valley that was found in the 1870s that was five and a half miles deep, and then there's a valley today near the Philippines called the Mariano Trench that's seven miles deep. They didn't understand that, though. They thought it was all flat. They didn't have the technology to check that out like we do today. And we can see it. We know that it's there. The springs of the sea that he mentions, there's no way man could have understood about the springs of the sea. Way down deep in the sea, you have these springs, even freshwater springs coming up at the bottom of the ocean. But here in Job, that's mentioned. That is scientific foreknowledge. If you go to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And this is one of my favorite ones in Psalm 8 and verse 8. It says, The birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. There's a really neat story behind this. A man by the name of Matthew Fontaine Murray who lived in the 1800s. He was sick in bed at one point in his life and he asked his son to come and to bring a Bible in and to read from him, read to him from the Bible. And his son had read this passage. He read Psalm 8. And when he read Psalm 8, verse 8, and talking about the fish that pass through the paths of the sea, Murray said, you know what? The Bible says there's paths in the sea, kind of like roadways, if you will. I'm going to go find those. And he went out and he found them. Today we know them as occurrence in the ocean, like the Gulf Stream that is off the eastern coast of the United States that runs from south to north. We know that there are all kinds of those. It, it's you know literally a current that's like a highway in the ocean. And fish will travel along that. And he read that. He said, the Bible says it's there. It's there. And he went out and he confirmed it. That scientific foreknowledge in the Word of God. That tells us the Word of God is inspired. Because man could not have put that in there. He could not have figured these things out. But then also, we want to notice this. That prophecy, and this is probably the strongest evidence for the inspiration of the Word of God. For someone to be able to look into the future and tell you with great detail what is going to unfold. The first thing we want to look at, out of evidence that demands a verdict, it makes note of this, but in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapters 26 and 27, talk about the destruction of Tyre, the city of Tyre in the modern day Lebanon. In Ezekiel chapter 26, we want to notice here verses 3 through 5. Ezekiel 26 verses 3 through 5. It says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes its waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be for a place of spreading the nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. It shall become plunder for the nations. So Tyre is going to be destroyed. Tyre was considered to be a stronghold. And it had stood for a very long time. And he's saying you're going to be destroyed. In fact, you're going to be so devastated. It's going to be where fishermen take their nets and just spread them out for drying. There won't be people there to interrupt it. There won't be the commerce, the buildings, all those things. It's, it's going to be obliterated. And so he tells them, I'm bringing the nations, plural, against you to get this done. It's going to happen. You keep on reading verses 7-9. through nine. It says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses and chariots and with horsemen, and an army with many people. He will slay with the sword your daughters, villages, and the fields. He will heap up a siege mound against you, build a wall against you, and raise a defense against you. He will direct his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. So he specifically said Nebuchadnezzar is going to do that. And three years after this prophecy was made, Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed Tyre, that city that was there as we consider today modern Lebanon. He defeated the city portion that was on the mainland. 
And here's what's very interesting. Let's read verses 12 to 14. It says, they, he switches from Nebuchadnezzar now. Notice that he switches in verse 12 to they. Remember earlier he said the nations, I'll bring them against you and they will plunder you, things like that. So verse 12, they will plunder your riches and pillage your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. They will lay your stones, your timbers, and your soil in the midst of the water. I will put an end to the sound of your songs, and the sound of your harp shall be heard no more. I will make you like the top of a rock, and you shall be a place for spreading nets, and you shall never be rebuilt. For I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord God. So that stronghold, that city-state, if you will, of Tyre would not exist anymore. But he makes note of they will plunder. This is a reference to Alexander the Great. Remember, you have those Old Testament kingdoms. You have Babylon. And then you have the Medes and Persians. And in the intertestament time, you have the Greek kingdom. Well, Alexander the Great, when he was sweeping down through this area to take it, he not only was able to take that mainland portion, but the people fled off onto the rock that was offshore. There was an island out there. They went there when Nebuchadnezzar attacked. In fact, when Nebuchadnezzar had attacked previously and he broke through the walls, the city was empty because they had evacuated out to the island. And out there they were protected. Nobody could really get to them. And so they lived on and they survived and things like that. But then when Alexander came down, they fled out to that little island piece. And for a while, they were trying to figure out, what do we do about this? Alexander then had his men take the rubble from the city that had been destroyed on the mainland and begin to throw it over into the ocean. And they built essentially a bridge over to the island. And he sent his siege weapons and his soldiers across that, and they took it. In fact, you can go on today and look at satellite pictures. That bridge is still there. It became a permanent part of the landscape that he had built. It used to be an island, now it's a peninsula out there. But that's how he took it. And so you see what has happened here, that the prophecy was fulfilled as God had said in taking the stones, the timber, the soil, and putting it in the midst of the water. Specifically talking about what Alexander did to be able to take the city of Tyre and completely conquer it. Then also we notice this. If you think about Christ's lineage in Genesis chapter 49, Genesis chapter 49 in verse 10, it says here, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. When you look into the New Testament, you understand as the Hebrew writer declares, and as we know from the list of genealogy in both Matthew and in Luke, that Jesus Christ came from the tribe of David, who came from the tribe of Judah, or from the descendants of David, from the tribe of Judah. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 14, it makes mention of this as well. Where he says, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. It foretold of him coming from the tribe of Judah, and that helps us to identify who the Christ is. The time of his coming. In Daniel chapter 4, as we talked about briefly in the class this morning, in Daniel chapter 2, rather, verse 44, it talks about this great image that. Daniel interprets as these various kingdoms from Babylon, as we mentioned a while ago, to the Medes and the Persian, to the Persian kingdom, to the Greek kingdom, and then, of course, to the Roman kingdom. And in the days of that fourth kingdom, which would be Rome in world history, that God would establish His kingdom that would never be destroyed. And so it is, we see that Jesus Christ came in the time of that fourth kingdom, in the time of the Caesars, as Luke chapter 2 points out. You notice Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Then it goes on to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. 
So there's a prophecy about Christ, of the timing of His birth. It tells us about the nature of Christ, which the Jews had a hard time grasping. If you go back to the book of Micah, chapter 5, Micah chapter 5, and notice in verse 2 what it says about the one who is to come. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So there's one that is to come from among them, be a ruler in Israel, so that's talking about his human side, but he's from everlasting. He is eternal. Well, how does that all get unraveled? Well, John chapter 1 tells us in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. So He's among men. He was born in Bethlehem of Judah. And He was one who was from everlasting. The nature of Christ was prophesied. But then, even more detailed. Let's go to the book of Psalms. And look at Psalm 41. Psalm 41, verse 9. Where you have all these details about the crucifixion of Christ. And these things were revealed a thousand years before Christ came into the world. In Psalm 41, verse 9. It says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That is a prophecy about Judas and him being one who was close to the Lord among the disciples, among those who were with him for three and a half years, hearing his teaching, seeing the miracles, sitting and eating meals with him, eating, even sitting there on that night observing the Passover. And he's the one who lifted up his heel against him. You go back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Obviously referring to the crucifixion of the nails going through the hands and nails going through the feet. How could David, a thousand years before, look forward to to one who would be his descendant, the one who would rule on his throne, and to talk about how he would be executed. How would he know that? Well, the only way he would know that is through divine inspiration. In Psalm 16, verse 10, Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your holy ones to see corruption. He's talking about, about the resurrection. Peter quotes that on the day of Pentecost when he talks about, you know, David's grave is still with us to this day. So he wasn't talking about David. He wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus of Nazareth who was put in that grave and he was raised from the dead. His flesh was not corrupted. And then you go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53 being a very detailed chapter about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, let's begin in verse 7 here. Isaiah 53, verse 7. It says, He was oppressed and He was afflicted. Yet He opened not His mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so He opened not His mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare His generation? For He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. So, cut off from the land of the living, he was killed, he was executed. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. His grave was made with the wicked. It was among men, among those who were considered to be sinners, but with the rich. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, put him in his grave. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. That's the resurrection. Cut off from the land of the living, verse 8, verse 10, he'll prolong his days. 
and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Mark makes specific mention that that number with the transgressors was because he was hung between two criminals. How could all of that detail be put into a chapter some seven centuries before Christ came into the world? Unless it was divine inspiration. Unless it was God who was able to look down through time and see exactly what was going to unfold. The prophecy of the Bible is the strongest evidence that it is the divine Word of God. It is inspired of God. If you would, go ahead and open up to number 818. 818. We want to be a people that believe the truth. We want to be rational. We want to be logical. We want to be confident. We don't want to follow things blindly. We do not want to be gullible. You know, some people give us the picture that people who believe in the Bible are just gullible, they're kind of simpletons, they're really not that well educated or sophisticated, and they just believe anything. The Bible is exactly contrary to that picture as it challenges us to read, to meditate, to think, to study, to test. Test the spirits. Search the scriptures daily. See if this is the truth. And when you examine it, you have an open and honest heart. There's only one conclusion that can be reached. It is the divine word of God. It is that on which we can build our lives and stake our eternal destiny. So we want to be a people who have that conviction, who have that outlook, that confidence, not being deluded by the lies of the world around us, but having rock-solid faith that will carry us through life and all the attacks that Satan will bring against us so that in the end, when we stand before our Creator in judgment, we'll be welcomed into a home because we have been good and faithful servants. Today, if you have not committed your life to the Savior who gave His Word that you might know Him, that you might understand what it takes to be His child, to have your sins forgiven, then won't you make that change in your life today? Make that commitment today. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins. Put that away out of your life. And commit yourself to Him in baptism. To be buried, to have your sins washed away, to rise up and to walk in newness of life. And if you're a child of God and your faith has wavered, you recognize there's changes I have to make in my life. Won't you recommit yourself to the Lord? If there's something that you need to publicly, publicly confess, then please do that. Come forward and confess it so that you can make your life right with God. We can pray with you and pray for you and encourage you in your life to serve Him. If you have a need, we invite you to come forward while we stand and while we sing.